Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today we are going to have a data preparation experiment. So, for uh, I'm using Titanic data set, but I alter it. So, because uh, you are pretty fam familiar with the data set, so you don't have to spend a good amount of time to know what does the variable means. So anyway, for today's experiment, please go to the week nine materials, download a uh, descriptive analysis notebook file, and also type a uh, Titanic underline alt.csv. Uh, please uh, bring both uh, into your Databricks account. Again, uh, descriptive analysis notebook and Titanic underlying ALC that's this. Please download, upload in your Databricks and make them ready for today's experiment. I give you a few minutes to uh, do all of them. Okay, so for any projects, uh, we have so many uh, common steps. So most specifically for in Christian standard, you see we have six major steps that are in the cycle, which means you might go back and forth. And the main reason is uh, usually improving your predictive performance. The first three steps are business understanding, data understanding, and data preparation which are uh, focused for today. So in, uh, we are working with the Titanic data set. So our business understanding is uh, the Titanic story, what happened and uh, basically what could be the main factors affecting the passenger survival. Data understanding has also happened because you, are, you, don't, you know what does each variable means. For example, um, age refers to age, Survival if somebody survived or not, okay, cabin number, city, BMI, so on and so forth. So, Titanic data is a famous one, so we already have the first two steps. The third step is uh, data preparation. The, for original Titanic data set, the data is almost ready. You just can bring it into your uh, machine learning algorithms and do your predictions. However, it's not the real case scenarios. 
in a rare case scenarios that refers to industrial jobs or researchers, you usually need to do a lot of data preparation. Having said that, so today I changed the Titanic data set and I uh, brought so many challenges, not so many, some challenges. And then by going through the challenges, you learn uh, the, the major activities that you might do for data preparation. So, but before that, let's talk a little bit about randomization. For, uh, you already know there is a random component machine learning algorithm. So this is pseudo-random, which means uh, your uh, for some random seats, your computer creates a set of new data. Here, from PySpark SQL, I'm bringing RAND and RANDN. RAND is for random data, RANDN for normalized data. First, I make a data frame uh, with a range of zero to nine, and the name of ID. So you see just a one column of a, uh, one data frame. These are some activities that sometimes is necessary for a project. Then I'm creating two uh, ran uh, random columns. One, uh, as you see, I'm using um, uniform distribution uh, with the random seed of 110. Second one is rand n, which creates a normalized random data with a seed of 220. I convert. Uh, created data set into pandas format I'm showing here. So right now I have two, I have uh, two columns of randomized data. Uh, one is just uniform distribution, the second normal distribution. And finally, with a described method, I'm uh, getting a, a simple statistical descriptions of those columns. So as you see, uh, both, uh, I've, yeah, for new unit form, all almost all the parameters are positive. For uh, normal, is uh, the mean is near zero, but it's negative here, and we have negative mean and positive uh, max. So later on, I, I, I will work with the random seed and randomized number. So this might be sometimes is needed for your own projects. But anyway, let's just start in the professional mode. And I make an app name, my project. And also I'm importing Titanic underline ALT.csv with and I let uh, uh, PySpark uh, find uh, a schema, and also I'm telling that there's a header in my data. I wait one or two minutes in case you want to add some comments or have questions, then I'll go to the next one. So when I look at the schema uh, that's uh, guessed by PySpark, so it seems to be okay. So passenger ID is integer. You know it's an integer, but uh, maybe we can deal with that. So survived 
is a uh, categorical one, but it said integer, class, double. That might uh, bring some issues because class is a passenger class, is one, two, three, why double? Sex is sibling, age double, it's not sibling, parent and children, ticket number, fair, cabin, city, and BMI. Uh, the weight, body mass index actually. So some of them could be a little weird, like survived and passenger ID, but the remaining uh, are relative uh, fail, relatively fail. Also, I put my data uh, dictionary for this uh, alternate uh, data set. As you see, BMI is something extra, and also I had some uh, uh, made up samples. So, from like uh, other cities. So when you look at the city column, you see something like Beijing and Delhi because it's just what I add to the data. Having said that, now I'm changing uh, some of column in first uh, schema. For example, I said passenger ID, let's be a string. And um, passenger class, so P class, also, I also change it to a string because like passenger class of one to three for me should be string, not a numerical value. Then I impose my new schema that I created to my data set. And with print the schema function, you can see the, uh, the schema of uh, uh, the schema that I impose to my current data. So now I have that show method. I'm just showing my uh, a snapshot of my data set. If you look at this data set here, can you spot some problems? Or something that looks uh, super weird? So look at column P class, which is the first, if you look at data dictionary, P class means passenger class. Do you see can Yes. So passenger class, we have one, two, three, but we have sometimes eight, eight. So what does it mean? You could, it could be error. Sometimes they are just refers to null or empty cells. Sometimes we, they don't have any Value they just threw a number, a, a fixed number for all this. So you need to know what, what exactly do they mean. Having said that, again, if you just throw this uh, table into the machine learning algorithm, your prediction rate might be very bad because you have some error like here, 888. What do they mean? So it's the reason I'm saying that would give a good amount of time for data preparation. Otherwise, you may end up having really a really bad model, which for somebody with the master of business analytics is really bad. So, I mean, getting bad prediction isn't too bad, but at least you should do your best to improve the prediction. Otherwise, if you just learn like how to apply decision tree, how to apply neural network, and you never look at the uh, quality of your data, you would be a low quality business analyst. Anyway, so I said that in the next block, as you see, I'm using replace method. I'm saying that whenever you see 888, if it's a numeric, convert to null. If it's a string, 88.0 is still converted to none. And also, I'm not, I don't want to work with all the columns because for me, something like ticket number 
may not be relevant to passenger survival rate. So for this reason, also I'm imposing a select method and just selecting the columns that makes sense. And you might remember also we worked with the um, empty cells in the previous class. In the next line, I make a loop over column names and find how many empty cells I, I do over there. So from this line, I can find how many empty cells I have in each column. I'm printing my results, and as you see, this is distribution of emptiness in my data. So it is distribution of emptiness in your data set. So what would you do with survived column? Do you think do you impute or drop or you do something else? Pardon me? Why? Yeah, deep. So this is the uh, exactly previous problem. In Titan data, so we want to predict survival. Uh, survive is a dependent variable we cannot impute. So we should drop those observations. What about P class? Do you impute? Do you drop? Impute. What about BMI? Why? Yes. So it seems almost uh, near one hundred percent are empty. So it may now you have a good justification for dropping. It. Still, you can impute it, and probably it doesn't harm. But if here at least, if you, when you drop, you have some justification why you did that. Okay, so yes. Okay, I'll give you one or two minutes if you want to add some comments or have questions, then I go to the next part. Okay, so in the next block, I'm just uh, dividing my number of empty cells uh, by total number of rows with DF count. You can find how many rows you have in your data set. And as Tingli said, if you look at BMI column, 0.95% uh, of observation under that column or empty. So it makes sense to get rid of that column. So you have a good justification saying that let's say more than 95% is empty. So you can, uh, now you can easily get rid of it. Still, if you impute it, that's okay. You have external variables. Here you just have maybe six or seven variables. 
So losing uh, unuseful variables is not that much important, but let's say you have 100 variables. So, and you want to do prediction. So dropping the variables with a high amount of emptiness is a good, uh, is a good practice because you might remember when you have too much variable, you might stuck in local minimum or have you, or you might have overfitting. So you do feature selections or sometimes like here, you have good justification for losing some variables. So you focus on most relevant variables. Okay, so in the next block, I dropped BMI because it was pretty, uh, almost vast majority uh, were empty. And I'm, again, I look at the uh, snapshot, of, the snapshot of my table, just, just 10 rows. So let's say for the value, uh, let's say which one, let's say for phase or age. Look at age. Do you think do you see some challenge you might have here? Yes. No or empty stuff. So and in the previous uh experiment, we increase with mod or mean if there is no outlier, you also can uh, you can do both of them. But it either increase with mode or me, uh, uh, say median or me, which are more uh, median is uh, more favorite one. What about CD? So how you deal with this, those null values? Mode, yeah. So CD is a categorical variable. Median or mean doesn't make sense. So mode is a one way of imputing your MP source. So in next few blocks, we do imputation. So for categorical variables such as passenger class, although passenger class is one, two, three, is a categorical variable. And for CD, uh, we, we can do uh, imputation with mode. For the numerical columns such as age and fair, you can impute with median. So having said that, first I make a copy of uh, my data set and I'm doing a deep copy and you might remember we had a good discussion about the deep copy or shell and shell copy beans, of how we can differentiate with them. Uh, then in the next line, I'm making a single imputer for medium. And I just uh, did imputation for column three, from three to four, four is excluded, three is included. So number three, uh, is one to zero, one to three is H. In the next block for column one to seven, which are my categorical values, as you see, I'm imputing with mode. And in the next line for uh, survive, since it's a dependent variable, whenever I see null, I'm just dropping. So with drop and A, I'm dropping the observations that the dependent variable is null. And when I go through, uh, I run the last line, which gives me distribution of emptiness. Now all of my columns are full. Number of empty cells are zero. So now it's good to go and I can do further analysis on top of it. Okay, let's uh, think I, I go too much. So I wait a little bit if you have questions or want to add comments, then I go to the next one. I only put some comments, but I, I highly recommend you guys also put your own comments. So later when you get to this point, you can easily remember uh, what was going on. Yes. I have a question regarding this QDH. Uh, let's say we've got a 
Uh, the issue is the, that age variable have less less uh, significance in prediction, but is the I mean the most the best way. So you don't lose information. If you drop those observations, you lose uh, some information because you you have other columns that are not empty and they bring some information that helps for prediction. If you impute. You don't add a new data. You don't add a new information. You just keep the other information that you have. Is yes, it's actually a very good question. So let me show you here. King is uh, under age. We have twenty percent empty. Let's let me just put all of the empty, or maybe something more. Let's say this is like twenty percent, my dad, right? So more, and we know in other columns. Let's say one of them could be fail, and the one is survive. We know that we have some info. So when you impute, you don't create a new data. You just uh, let it uh, work. You just keep your current information. And the current information are in other columns of those observations here and here. King is said uh, for this 20%, maybe instead of just simply imputing uh, median, why you don't use predictive imputers like random forest? With random forest, you predict those empty values. If your data set is a small, it could be a good way of doing that. Uh, it's not my favorite one because I, the goal is not uh, creating information. Okay? Random forest is a good one. Uh, I don't say it's a bad method. But this course is big data. So when you have a huge amount of data, using random forest for predicting the, the value for this empty, empty cell, uh, may not be very perfect, but it's a good thing. If you have a good supercomputer, yes. That's a, one of the ways to do the imputation. Okay, the next plug I'm doing is descriptive statistics over uh, my numerical columns. So, looking at this table, do you, could you see what could be challenging or questionable? Which information could be questionable for you? Yeah, it, mm -hmm. parent and children, parchment. Yeah, yeah. So both of you are right. So I did this uh, age between point. 42 and 120. So 42, uh, maybe some of just a newborn baby. And could be, but maybe IDD has extra information. She knows there are no newborn baby. And there is, there is a difference with nobody more than like less than 90 years old. So if you have extra information, maybe you can justify and then blame the, the quality of your data. So what can you do? You go back to the 
previous step, maybe you drop those observations. So anything you see less than 10 years old or less than more than 90, you just get rid of them. On top of that, this is actually good practice. Even if the information is correct, having those outliers of age might not be informative. Let's say if somebody is just newborn or somebody too old, maybe with a big bang or big noise, they, they die, but they get might be heart attack. Or with a, a small change in temperature, a newborn baby could die. So maybe these information is not contributing and it just uh, deviates your accuracy because uh, making that uh, cr crash with the ice, uh, I mean, the survival of the crash after that ice might have more uh, important variables than just age of some. If somebody have uh, those outlying ages, maybe uh, those crash is not that much relevant to them. Also for fail, yeah, some maybe, you could say somebody just sneak into the ship and they never paid. So anyway, with this discrete statistic, you need to justify your data, see if it makes sense for you. For age, even it happened for my dissertation, so I wanted to predict survival of patient after heart surgery. Uh, I said, okay, somebody less than 10 years old so, or more than 80 years old, it just ruined my model because maybe the characteristics of the independent variables are very different from them than other groups. Maybe we can just exclude them and do prediction with the remaining. But these are really, really good answers. Thank you very much. Sometimes, at least we can find some uh, filters to get rid of some uh, values that definitely they are not true. Here, I don't have a negative age, but I just do the filter for the cases that might be really intuitive. So in this case, you have two ways. One, maybe you can filter them out. Or if you, for sure here, we're pretty sure that native age is, doesn't make sense. Maybe you make them empty and then impute with median. This is another way of handling. But this type of uh, challenge is very common, but if you get to internship or you want to do research projects. If I put add a comment here, I might say maybe for negative ages, you replace their value with null and impute them. And there a uh, more objective way of getting rid of those observations is uh, you run, uh, you find a quantile and there's a formula for a statistical outliers. So anything above upper bound or lower bound of uh, 1.5 sun division from quantiles is outlier. Here, with this uh, approx quantile, um, Function, I'm making a dictionary of quantiles, and I basically I'm doing quantiles for age and number of siblings, parental children, and also faith. And 
I'm trying to make lower than upper bound. So I'm just saying that anything uh, less than first quantile minus 1.5 IQR and anything above uh, third quartile is plus 1.5 uh, times interquartile or IQR should be outliers. So now I have a uh, lower bond and upper bond for uh, outliers. And I can just find the values for each numerical variable. What I do, uh, I did uh, my own creativity, but it's not the only way. So maybe we can find easier way. So for H, I'm making H up for sibling H sibling up. Pass children out and fail out. Then I made the loop. I go to A, check H one by one. If I see any outlier, the indicator would be one. Otherwise, zero. For example, here for H, we got two. Two is very low. In my formula, if you go upper, let me show you this. Um, Okay, so for age, lower bound is 2.5, upper bound 54.5. Anything above and less is outlier. So it's the reason when I did look through my age column, if it's ages two, is less than 2.5, it's outliers, and so indicator column is one. And I did the same for the others. So uh, I basically here I did the loop over each column. I made the indicator that column. If it's this outlier, one. Otherwise, see. So up to now, I know uh, in which columns I have uh, an outlier. And next step, I can just easily drop them. So whenever there's one, I just I would say just drop that that row or observation. So what I'm doing, I'm making a new column of outliers, and I would say this is summation of all, all, all four other indicator columns. So for example, here is three. It just means in three indicators, it's an outlier. Summation of this one, one, one is three. Some of them is just one, some could be less or more. What I would do here, I'm just saying that give me a table that's its uh, outliers column is just zero. So if it's zero, then it means it's not outlier in any other columns. Then I'm I'm just want to get rid of those fair the out whatever fair out outliers parent and children. So I'm just selecting the columns that I want to work with from now. And as you see, when later I uh, Run, uh, I run this script to the statistics and sounds okay. So then I look at how, how much uh, observation I lost. As you see, uh, I lost almost 36% of my data, might be a little significant. 
maybe you can go back and say, let's say uh, I don't want to drop the observations that the age is outlier. What can you do? Uh, Maybe for eight, you just uh, gave up because it's not after it. But what can you do? Maybe some agents point less than 0.4, 1.5, let's say 10, 20, 30. Some of them are 80, 84. One way of dealing with that, maybe change the category for variable. It would say whatever from 0.4 to 0.2.5. That's or maybe let's say even 10. Is maybe juvenile? This one adult and more than let's say more than 80 is old. So even uh Sometimes, uh, if you want to get rid of arteries, maybe sometimes you lose too much. So you need to think about, sometimes it's inevitable. So some of for some observations, almost all the row is empty. So you don't have any way to, except for just dropping that. But looking at QCDM standards, it's, this is a cycle. So sometimes you, need, you go, you do some experiment, you go forward, then go back, fix something, then check go back, back and forth. So this cycle just means you might do this step several times until you get a good predictive performance. So there is no guarantee if your way is 100% uh, correct. Sometimes you have to do a lot of experiments. Okay, let's do some basic visualizations in PySpark environment through Databricks. So the first step is, it's exactly the same. You need to run these two code. So you just need to register a template ID name. So I just said it's a name, random name here. I said, let's say data clean. And I register on top of the data clean data set. But then name is arbitrary. You don't have to pick that blue, exactly put that blue name. So you can change it. And I need to run display function. And basically select, select all the uh, transactions that I do. From now, this two, you repeat these two lines. So what, what does it mean? You introduce observations to Databricks. Then you can do your visualizations. Having said that, let me show you uh, one empty block. I'm importing something above. Here, just drop down, but anyway. So I copy and paste these two lines for registering my data set and um, running the display function. So let me just copy and paste again. So when you run these two lines, you just see a table, just show a table. But now look at bottom. So it asks, when I hover my mouse over this shape, it, it tells this really has a bar chart. Just click on it. You have a bar chart, but it's not what I created here. In order to make your own specific visualizations, click on plot options. So keys are your x-axis. Let's say I put survive. For values, maybe I put IDs because I want to count uh, how many people survived. And I change aggregation from sum to count. Sometimes you use some function, sometimes average, maximum, apply. You do the exact same visualization. 
So from now, these two lines are same. These are just for introducing your data set to uh, Databricks and saying that you want to use them for visualizations. I do some uh, other examples. Actually, even the last line is enough because we already introduced the, uh, your template before. So each time you just run the display function. In the next one, when I click on more option, look on the uh, lower right, I picked pie chart and also there's so many other uh, visualizations. This time for city, I'm, I'm for keys, I'm sitting city, no grouping values is survived and I'm counting. So because survive is one, so if you count ones, it tell you how many people survive, but you also can change it to count. That should be fine. So it seems, uh, yeah, Beijing has the lowest number of survived people. High, I think the highest one, is, uh, I guess, is Southampton. So most of survived people are from that city. Let's work with the grouping. So in the next block, when I click on plot options, as you see, I'm just saying that I want to count. Uh, here I want to look at the total paid fare. My keys are city. I'm, I'm looking the fare value, but also I'm grouping based on the gender or sex. And as you see, it's a pie chart. I'm summing up all of my fares. So you have two groups. It seems for uh, most, um, I mean, still South Hamden has the highest amount of uh, paid fare for both genders. For female, I think the lowest in the Beijing, you have the lowest amount of fare. For male, it's in Queensland as the lowest amount of paid fare. I just wait a little bit here, so in case you guys have question or you want to add some comments for visualizations, then I go to the next one. And for your final project, use these visualizations or any visualization that you do in actual Spark environment. Don't do a Python or Tableau visualizations. And it's pretty easy. You can just you introduce the, your data set into uh, in, into Databricks, and with simply plot options, you can pick the plots that is more relevant. You don't have to use pie chart, bar chart, but this other Fact, like histograms, box plot, QQ plot, um, scatter plot. Just pick the ones that is more relevant to your project. Okay, let's make another bar chart. So this time I'm going to look at cities and count how many people survived. Sorry, with the IDs, you count how many passengers you had. If you want to find how many survived, you do summation over survive. But with count over IDs, you find how many people, how many passengers you had from each city. 
Okay, so looking, let's look at the previous uh, visualization blocks and find the issues. Um, so let's, this is your, looking at this bar chart, do you think it could bring some challenges for you later on? Uh, which challenges? Yes, very correct. So, uh, Tim is very right. So, if you look at survived, you uh, you see that a number of people who, who survived, which is uh, in, the indicator is one, is much less than didn't survive. So, when you train your model, your model would be trained much better on uh, uh, people who didn't survive, or the ID number is zero. What about two figures? And you know that when your balance is not balanced, you do uh, uh, resampling or re uh, rebalancing algorithms. So you balance your observations. Okay, so what about here? So if you look at, uh, remember previous classes, we talk about uh, label encoding, encoding and one hot encoding. Here we have six uh, variables with six uh, categories. If you do one hot encoding, you make six new variables. So it may not productive. So maybe you, instead of do simple one hot encoding, you match some categories, maybe here, you have one category for Southampton or S, because it's like almost 52%. Maybe you merge uh, Beijing and Delhi, B and D, because they are uh, Asian cities. Maybe you can say, uh, these are Asian cities, I merge them together. So anyway, when you have too much of categories, maybe one hot hand is not great. First of all, you, have, you make a very crowded table. If also when you have too many dummy variables, sometimes that variable loses importance because its importance, predictive performance would distribute to so many dummy variables. Maybe none of them would be important because you just distribute the information to so many extra columns. You can do label encoding here or you merge categories and you do one hot encoding. But when you merge categories, it should make sense. You cannot just merge anything because of uh, you want to have a, a better looking data set. So the merger should have some uh, meaning. Let me see here. What I think. Yeah. Here also I can do summation over survive because survive is zero and one. So that should be, oh, no, not sum, sorry. Because if I sum, all of the zeros would be one. So I should it count it or, or the variables, either ID or survive should be fine. If you do summation for zero would be all of them would be zero because summation of zeros would be zero. So I think this example also re refers to Tingley's uh, attention because if you, maybe you want to predict female and male survival and uh, number of observation for male is much more than female. In those cases, maybe um, your mother won't be that much great for predicting uh, survival, of, survival of female passengers because their observation is much less. Again, in these cases, you do resampling methods. So you either create uh, new uh, synth synthesized observations, or you just uh, repeat some of the observations to just balance out 
uh, those categories. Okay, what about here? Here I have passenger classes and I'm looking at counting how many passengers I have. If you don't like P, uh, PQLS, PQLS, maybe you can just put IDs here. But we are counting unique values, so it shouldn't be fine. So. I think team we also found another issue. So passenger class is either one to three. So what does it what what does it make if the passenger class two point five or one point five? And maybe there's an issue or three point three. So maybe there is a issue typo or whatever. So sometimes even in visualizations you find some issues. Maybe you go back. So if it's uh, due to error or typos. Maybe you can just make it null or impute or just drop them. Sometimes if you impute, make it make them null and impute, it's better. But definitely 3.3, 1.5, and 2.5 are errors. That they shouldn't be there. So if you, in your final project, so this year I might give you a, a data set like this, has several issues, and I let you, I ask you to predict the dependent variable, you need to go a lot of data preparation. You should look over like maybe outliers, some typos or somebody that doesn't make sense. And maybe sometimes through descriptive statistics like mean, max, mean, median, you can find those issues. Sometimes you eyeballing or sometimes uh, like here, you do some visualizations and you may find some issues that you need to answer it. Just keep in mind, it could be one of the qu so, uh, questions for your final exam. Oh, in the last but not least figure, if you look at plot options, you see for each, uh, for the keys, I put class and sex together. You don't have to just use one variable, right? you can just put multiples. But uh, the way that the data would be reflected is different. So in the previous one, I did grouping with six. So I have uh, two different uh, colors reflecting each category. In the next one, I just put these two next to each other. So either is fine, it's just different ways of uh, showing your data in case uh, if you think it's better, you can do either ones. But you just need to know what is the interpretation of values, what is the interpretation of subgrouping and keys. Also, you need to know how to, when you should different aggregations, either sum, average, mean, max, count, how to pick new um, display type or this, uh, different figures. These are the most important ones. And as you see, it's easy, but Finding issue, interpreting your result is much, much more important. And again, I'm telling you one month in advance, uh, I give you a problematic uh, data set and ask you to do prediction. So you can just simply bring your data in the machine learning algorithm and do prediction, but you lose some credit. You should, I should see you look over data preparation a lot and try to find issues and fix them. Any questions so far? And I don't also don't see any question from people over Zoom. So yeah, I mean, if you don't ask questions, I finish much faster, but you might later find some problems. So. I usually dedicate some part of the class for questions and answers, but today we don't have we didn't have that much. So uh, anyway, that was for today. So let's do the attendance for now.